If you've ever dreamed about floating through France on a boat, then this video is for you, as I explain some of the practical aspects, like costs, licenses, guidebooks, and depth, while also showing you some of the beautiful aspects of this very worthwhile adventure. I'm Maya, and this is Aladino. In mid-November, we converted our 28-foot sailboat into a riverboat, and we started going north, from the Mediterranean all the way to the North Sea. In front of us, we had 2,000 kilometers and 200 locks. Join us as we navigate river currents, discover incredible places, cruise through canals, wait out a global pandemic in the heart of France, and record the whole voyage with a new episode every Friday. This is North Through the Continent. We're going north through the continent. The Canals of France To tell the truth, we set out on this whole inland journey because it was just a convenient way to get north during the winter months. But this voyage has become a lot more than just a way to get from A to B. A trip through France can sometimes feel like a trip through time. The pace really is slower here. Attention is paid to things like beauty and joy. And if you try to go quickly, it could become frustrating. But if you embrace the slowness and the unpredictability, it can be magical. So in this episode, we travel slowly from Bomley Dam to somewhere slightly upriver from there on the Rhone Rhine Canal. And along the way, I share some of the things we've learned for those of you who might want to do the voyage yourself one day. Good morning. So we are still in Baume les Dames, which is where we ended the last episode. Now we are continuing to head up river. Now last night I went for a walk along the canal. Uh, just up here we enter back into the River Doube. And so as I was walking along the canal and into the entranceway with the River Doube, I noticed that the current is a lot stronger than normal because we've had a lot of rain in the past few days. Um, so we'll see how it goes. I mean, compared to coming up the Rhone and the Sound in November and December, I don't imagine it can be worse than that. And maybe it'll already have calmed down because it didn't rain a lot overnight. We'll see what happens. There's more adventures ahead. <laughs> Also, since we left Chalon, we haven't gotten new fuel in the pink, but we're carrying these extra jugs. We often get asked how much fuel is needed for this trip, but that answer can change a lot, depending on what kind of engine you have and what route you're taking. When we battled against the very strong currents of the Rhone River in November and December, we found we were burning around 20 liters of diesel a day for our 21 horsepower engine. Now that it's summertime and we're in the smaller canals with less current, we had actually only burned about 40 liters in seven days of travel. This is also because there are a lot of little locks along the way, and so the engine spent quite a while on idle, which doesn't use up much fuel. It is recommended to keep the engine on idle in the locks rather than turning it off completely, just in case things go wrong and you need to be able to maneuver quickly. Although we did find fuel docks in a few places, the price was always a lot higher. And especially in off-season, they're sometimes not in operation at all. If you're doing a trip in France, you might find yourself lugging jerry cans back to the boat at least once. That's a good reason to have lots of jerry cans, a big fuel tank, and a fuel-efficient engine. I don't know how it was possible that on like two previous boats I always try to fill them in uh, using a funnel. This siphon hose is truly the best thing ever. Uh, even when sailing, I mean, yeah, you have to watch out not to get salt water into there. But I literally don't have to do anything and it siphons the diesel from one jug into the tank. Basically, all you need is this fitting at the end, which has the, the ball in it, this one here. So you can put this on any hose. 
We haven't gotten far yet. We're in the same town at the lock. It actually is not working, so we called the technician and uh, they're coming. We have experienced a few glitches with the locks that require a phone call to a technician to come fix the problem. Usually the technicians come pretty quickly and we've never had to wait too long. Okay, that took about two hours, but finally someone from VNF came to open the lock and fix whatever was going wrong with it. So I think we should be on our way again. The technician fixed the lock quickly and we headed in. We're in a little canal section now. Soon we'll be joining the river and as always, we'll be weaving in and out of canals and rivers all day. A little bit of a later start than we were hoping for because we do actually want to get some miles behind us, but what can you do? Like I've said before, no one takes the French canals because they want to set a speed record. Yep, the river was still looking pretty swollen from the rain of the previous few days, but Magic Carpet did just fine. And then, like always, we came up to the next lock. You should sing the Lion King theme song while you do that. <laughs> Bamboleiro! No, no! Oh, is that the wrong one? I don't know. I'm Aladdin, not the Lion King. <laughs> two people going up the locks, I think the first thing that we have realized is that it's a lot easier, if at all possible, to have one person go up to stand on the top of the lock to catch the lines um, and then to place the lines how you want them. So this either means, like usually it's me, I get off the boat just before the lock because there's usually a dock and then I meet Aladino and he throws the lines up to me. The other way that we do it, if there's no dock, is there's always a ladder in the lock, so we'll motor up to the ladder and I'll climb up holding the ropes. The best option when going up a lock is just to slip the lines onto the bollards using a long boat hook. Unfortunately, we often found that even our longest boat hook wasn't long enough. Magic carpet is quite low in the water. If you're on a motorboat with more freeboard, then I imagine this would be much easier. In the smaller locks, the water pours in from the front, so try to position the boat nearer the back to avoid the stronger current. Compared to going up a lock, going down is a real breeze. You motor right in, casually step off, and then let the line play out. At the end, you just pull the line down from the bollard. Plus, going down has the added benefit that there's barely any current in the water. It just gently seeps out. A good thing to know is that locking procedure changes a lot depending on your route. Sometimes there may be lock keepers who will help you with the lines. Sometimes you may be given a remote and you have to figure out everything yourself. In the larger rivers, there are usually floating bollards so you don't even have to adjust your lines. Every different locking method will require a slightly different approach. The important things are to go slow when entering and exiting and to have all your lines, fenders, and boat hooks prepared well ahead of time. The other interesting thing about the locks is that almost always, I mean not in the more rural sections, but very often you have an audience as you're going up or down the lock. And sometimes this is really nice, sometimes uh, they come and talk to you and you share a little story as you go up the lock. Sometimes honestly it's super weird because they're just like standing there staring at you and they don't acknowledge you and you feel like, oh my gosh, like if I mess up I have a whole audience. Um, but mostly it's nice and we've had a few nice conversations with people watching but that's definitely like especially at the beginning it can be a little bit nerve-wracking. I mean I understand it must be a spectacle to see a boat going up and down the lock especially if you're not much of a boater so uh, there's that. Another question folks are always curious about is the cost and availability of docks and the cost to use the locks. There's almost always a dock either in front of or behind a lock and so you can tie up there for the night. There's no amenities usually, like there's no water, no electricity, but it's a nice free place to stay. Um, and it's free because it's included in sort of the lock pass. So you have to buy a vignette, they call it, from VNF, which is the organization which manages all of France's inland waterways. The vignette is not too expensive. For our size boat, it was like 110 a month. 110 euros for the month to use all the canals, uh, which I think is totally fair. So you use all the canals, you can tie up in front of the locks 
for the yeah. space of a month. And it changes slightly depending on the size of your boat, but I don't yeah. think it's, you know, horrendously expensive. No. And if there is a town where you happen to stay, uh, most of the times there is a campground as well. So then you do have to pay to stay there, but there is showers, which yeah. was not the case now because of lockdown. So we were enjoying uh, hot water cockpit showers. But yeah, normally there is the opportunity. The vignette has to be visible somewhere on your boat. Purchasing your vignette can be done on the VNF website or in person at a VNF office. VNF stands for Voix Navigable Française, and it's the organization that manages the waterways. So I just helped Aladino tie the boat up in the lock, then I passed all the lines to him and I grabbed the camera to show you around. I love these locks that are right next to the weirs in the river. It's so dramatic to be rising up this lock right next to this kind of small waterfall. Doesn't seem to work. It's not working. It's not starting the lock. I've tried it like four or five times now. Good, we know the phone number of technical support. Oh my gosh, how many times have we called it now? Four. Five. Well, this year or <laughs> <laughs> I thought usually there is a sensor that can tell if the boat came in or not. Oh maybe it's this thing. <laughs> Huh. A little delayed. Little trick question. What does one eat in France? Well, judging Pasta. from all the tomato sauce. Next yeah, to your mouth. Always pasta. Oh god. <laughs> <laughs> you really do have tomato sauce next to your mouth. I think I have to go around the corner. Oh no, there we go. Yay! How, how did you get here? I don't know. You have to turn around? Sorry? What is the question? Is, are you in the right spot? I think so. I don't know how to get there otherwise. Ooh. Not a lot of water right here. Have a look at Navionics. Because uh, to the right was the weir. But was there another channel mm, back there? I didn't see it. Quick. Mm, yeah. There was a turn back there. Oh. Anyway, wow, that's why. Have a look at the sign. It's covered, fully hidden. So behind that tree there is a sign with an arrow indicating that's the inlet. I didn't see that. Sure enough, we had taken a wrong turn. There was another offshoot of the canal back downstream that we should have taken instead. Who knew you could take the wrong exit on a river? Usually the canals are pretty well signposted, but nonetheless, things can happen. So it's always good to have a backup. We use Navionics on the iPad to get an overview of where we're going, which is what I checked here to figure out what the correct route should be. 
There are also guidebooks for the canals. We don't rely on these guidebooks for practical information since often they can be outdated, but I have found that Hugh McKnight's Cruising French Waterways is a good one for learning about some of the history and things to see along the way. As far as reading and understanding the signs on the canals, there's a course you have to take for that. It's called the 70 Inland Waterways Exam, and it covers the rules of the road and all the signage. It's pretty straightforward, and I took it online with international yacht training. However, you can't take the 70 exam unless you also have your ICC, which stands for an International Certificate of Competency. Like an international driver's license, this is sort of just a translation of whatever boating license your country endorses. You have to look up which courses to take in your country to be eligible for an ICC. The ICC with 70 endorsements are a requirement for pleasure boaters in France's inland waterways, and it's a bit of a contentious requirement, since people who rent boats here don't actually need the license at all. It's kind of like saying people who rent cars don't need a driver's license to drive them on the highway, but that's how it is, and if you go through France on your own boat, you will need this. And now for my final point before we dock for the evening, the question of depth. We get asked this a lot, and I rarely answer in the comments because it's very complicated. Depending on what route you take and what time of year it is, maximum depth can change a lot, and you should check on the VNF website. But I will say this, if you're considering going through the smaller canals, meaning not the main commercial routes like the Rhone or the Rhine rivers, then I wouldn't try it with anything over a 1 meter 70 draft. Technically, I think the Rhone-Rhine canal, which we're in right now, allows for up to 1 meter 80, but judging from our depth sounder along the way, I think it'd be hitting the bottom a lot if you were actually that deep. Anything over 2 meters, and I can guarantee that you won't make it through. The commercial routes are of course different, and there we usually had at least 4 meters of water under our keel. And now that I've said all that, the most important advice of all is to soak it all in. The practicalities all need to be taken care of before you leave, but once you're on your boat, Floating along beneath the shade of ancient trees, the French canals are all about immersing yourself in the now. Listen to vintage French music, look at art, read poetry, pick wildflowers. Give yourself room to find the romance in this voyage, for it is truly unlike anything else I've ever done. That night, we tied up to a free dock by an ecluse, which is French for lock. There wasn't much of anything around, except for the sounds of nature and the rich smell of wet grass. We grilled dinner on the fire, and I plucked some tunes on the guitar. This is what I especially love about the French canals. One night, you can be in an antique town, sipping wine while an elegantly dressed waiter brings you local delicacies. And the next night, you can forget about civilization for just a moment as you sit by a gently murmuring river. Thank you so much for watching. If you found this episode helpful or inspiring, please click that thumbs up button and subscribe to our channel for a new video every single Friday. An extra thank you to our patrons for making it possible for us to keep producing these episodes and an extra, extra big thank you to these folks who really go the extra mile to make sure these episodes keep being produced. We'll see you next week. <laughs>